talked to heaps of people who say that they want to do what we've done, selling our house in suburbia and moving out to the country to a hobby farm. So today I'm going to go through 20 things that you need to consider before moving to the country or buying a farm. So something to consider before buying a farm is the cost of feeding all your animals. A lot of people who want to do this want to do it to become self-sufficient. But they forget that there's still a cost involved in that. And the cost is the food. Whether you're buying whole grains like I do and sprout them for yourself, or buy a pre-mixed lot or pellets, it's all a cost and it's very expensive. We buy our grains by the ton, which makes it half the price it would be if we were to buy it in bags. But it's still really expensive. We're outlaying $500, $500 a bag. It's a lot of money, it will last a few months. Um, but you've got to come up with that. You've got to. If you're lucky enough to buy a farm that has productive fruit trees, then that's something else you don't have to worry about. But if like that, but if like us, your fruit trees aren't productive because they haven't been cared for, or you have to plant new fruit trees, you need to wait at least five to six years before you get any sort of decent harvest. So if you dream to be self-sufficient, your self-sufficient dreams may take five or so years. else to consider is taking care of your animals and I don't mean just the feeding and the watering obviously that's a no-brainer but if you're gonna have baby animals things like ducking their tails or castrating them if they're a boy um, shearing them if they're not a dropping sheep um, like the Dorfers or Wiltshires but even then we have um, Wiltshires and Dorfers that do need a trim because they don't lose 100% of their fur um, and trimming the hooves. Um, you don't have to do that immediately, but every year or every other year, if those hooves haven't um, ground back properly, then you're going to need to um, do that yourself. Or pay someone to do it, which is another cost if you can't do it or don't want to do it. Another thing to think about is the infrastructure you're going to need on your farm. If you're a smaller scale farm, five to 10 acres, you probably don't need a tractor. But we're on 54 acres and we're on a steep hill. So something like a four wheel drive tractor is ideal for us. Not only do you need it, but you need to know how to drive it. And these things aren't easy to drive. I'm not game enough to drive it, but hubby does. But even though he's confident in driving stuff like this, he still needs to learn how to use all the levers and, and stuff like that. So there is a learning curve there too. You don't just need tractors, but if you're in a cold area like we are, you're going to need something like a wood splitter, unless you're willing to do it by hand. Good on you if you are, but that's a lot of work. Um, things like animal pens, chicken houses. If it's not already there, you guys need to build that. Um, a pig pen, pig shelters. If you want to milk, you need um, a milking stanchion. What else? If you have lambs and you're in an area like us that gets foxes or eagles that um, take lambs, then you're going to need to have a pen to put those animals up until they're big, big and strong enough to spend somewhere to store your wood. If you've got no infrastructure, these are the things you need to think about. If you've got nowhere to store your wood, it's going to get wet and you can't burn it. I'm speaking from experience. I had wet wood and it was a nightmare to light or keep alight. Um, if you want to process your own chickens or meat, you need to have a pool room or you need somewhere that you can butcher. Um, Something that I didn't know about, even when we were looking at farms, it was only when we purchased um, some tools from another farmer and we went out to his property. It was in the beautiful Yarra Valley in Victoria. Surrounded by fruit trees and it's a huge fruit growing area and all of a sudden we heard this bang and I just thought it was a farmer shooting um, but then it happened again and again and he must have seen by the look on my face that I was like what's that and he said to me oh 
around you are there heaps of commercial farms that grow fruit because if there are it's likely that they're going to be using something like a cannon to scare them away can you see the wedge tail eagle just above that tree they live in the forest next door they are absolutely stunning But they're a predator and they didn't really think about them being a predator. I knew that would get foxes, especially because we have forests and we're surrounded by farmland. But I didn't think, hey, an eagle t could take a baby lamb that's a week under a week old. So just think about where you are and if you're willing to be predator proof. That means locking your chickens away if you've got foxes or coyotes or something like that, um, depending where in the world you are. We don't have coyotes here, we have foxes and wild dogs. Um, if you're willing to lock your chickens up every night, sometimes they come during the day, they're quite brazen. If you have something like lambs and eagles, you need to be willing to lock up your lambs for at least a week. So you need the infrastructure to do that, the food to do that, food being um, either hay, I use loose and hay or loose and char. Pallets if you want to do that, I found that made my, seat, my sheep sick. Um, and you can also have foxes take lambs too, so not only will the eagles take them, but the foxes will take them too. Even if you haven't got a neighbour directly next to you, they may still be spraying. And if it's really windy like it is here, you're still going to get that come onto your land with the wind and the breeze. So you just need to be aware that if you want to be fully organic and chemical free, not just for your land, but for your health, just be aware of who is around you or what sort of area it is. If it's like a strawberry growing area or a potato growing area, it's going to be a high chance that they're going to be spraying. Even a market farm, high chance they're going to be spraying if there's lots of those sorts of farms around you, one might pop up next door. You should just consider that when you are um, purchasing your farm. We're in an area where there's lots of hobby farmers, like I said before, but there are a few dairies here because it's so green and lush. There's two at the end of um, each of the streets. Um, they don't really spray. They might spray a little bit, maybe a bit of Roundup on their pasture. We're far enough from those that it doesn't affect us. I don't think a dairy would open up at this end of the street. They may buy the farms, keep buying the farms down the road as they got for sale. I'm going to tell you a story about this awesome farm that we found that was in our price range. It was so cheap. It was pretty close to Melbourne. It was only 10 acres, I think, but it had basically everything we needed. It had a four bedroom house, it had this massive, massive shed. The shed was as big as our suburban block. It was over 750 square meters. It was just insane. So we went to another real estate agent just to get a comparison on other properties in the area. And we told him that the price range this farm was in. And he's like, oh, there's no farms around here at that price range, that's too cheap. And we're like, well, we just went and looked at one and it was that price. And he's not like, it's not such and such farm, is it? And gave us the address and we're like, yeah. He's like, oh, it's that cheap because the property is affected by Dildren. It wasn't in the section 32. The real estate agent didn't disclose it. I actually rang, rang him up the next day to question him about it. Once questioned, he was able to tell me the truth. And yeah, it had Dildren on it. I didn't know what Dildren was. Dildren was a chemical used in the 50s, um, sorry, the 60s, 70s-ish. And um, it was used in potato farming to control one of the nematodes in the ground, I believe. Um, 
and it's a residual chemical so it's still there today even 40 50 years later it's still in the ground and it's a carcinogenic it's really horrible for your health it's cancer causing it's all sorts of horrible disease causing um, chemical so I didn't even think I didn't even think to consider something like that so if you're in, it, in an area that's growing something like potatoes or something else that would use a residual chemical like that, it might pay to get a soil test and have your contract. Well, in Australia you can do it. I don't know about anywhere else, but in Australia you can do subject to soil test if that's what's really important to you. It's important to me that there's no residual chemicals. Something like Roundup is not residual. Um, it will wash away or evaporate or something like that. I don't really know. Um, but something like Dildren, is toxic. It doesn't just get into your plants, it gets into your waterways and it'll get into your cattle if you're grazing them on the ground too. So these people were grazing cattle and they were selling them at the market for meat. Those cattle would have had dildren in their system. You would be eating that even though they're grass fed, they're not organic because they've got horrible pesticides in them. Um, so yeah, even if you're like, oh, I'm just grazing stock, well, those chemicals are going to go into your stock and if you're eating them, if your family and friends are eating them, they're all going to be affected by it. Sometimes you need to be prepared to drop all your plans, everything you wanted to do for the day, whether it was to go, whether it was to go do grocery shopping, go to home school meetup, clean the house, cook lunch and dinner, plan a veggie patch. Sometimes you need to be flexible and drop all your plans. So last week I found Anna was down. Couldn't get her back up. And I spent all day outside with her trying to get her on her feet. Stuff like that happens and as I've come to realize in our short time here, it happens quite regularly. Not necessarily a sheep being down, but maybe sheep escaping having a newborn lamb and having to round them up, um, round them up with their mum and bringing them down. It all takes time and sometimes you're pushed for time and you really need to do something but sometimes you just got to drop it all and focus on your problem that you need to solve. When we were at a suburban house and we were renovating and we were really pushed for time, sometimes we'd be working all day and all night as soon as we woke up, as soon as we went to bed, we'd be working on the house, trying to finish it to buy the farm. And sometimes on the farm, you do the same sort of thing. It might not be renovating your house, unless your house needs renovating. We're lucky that ours doesn't require renovating. But there's things like fixing fences or, you know, helping your animals, whether it's tagging or drenching or shearing, moving them fences, I think I already said that, planting a veggie patch, harvesting. Sometimes there's days where you just don't have time to cook a really nice homemade meal, but if you don't, <laughs> there's no around here to get takeaway from. I'm about 15 minutes from town, there's one takeaway place that's okay, and I'm 30 minutes from the next major town that has all the takeaway you could imagine. By the time I drive home, it's going to be cold, but if I don't have time to cook, I'm not gonna have time to be able to drive an hour just to get food, so I might as well just cook it to begin with. So if you're living out, a bit further out in a rural spot, that's not, you know, some country town, some farms are close to the town and you have those conveniences, but sometimes when you're out in a spot like we are, which is awesome and we love it and we wouldn't change it for the world, you don't have conveniences like that. Another convenience would be like petrol. The other day I was on empty and I needed to go somewhere that had no petrol so I had to go all the way into town, 15 minutes, fill up with fuel and then go in the opposite direction. If you're like us and want to be self-sufficient and grow all your own fruit and veg and um, rear all your own animals for meat, or milk um, or eggs and stuff like that, you can't just pack up and go on a holiday. <laughs> We used to go on heaps of holidays and it was awesome. And we knew that when we bought the farm that we wouldn't be able to do that anymore. 
we're lucky that the farm is somewhere that we would have liked to go on holidays it was like a dream destination out here we love the high country we're not too far from the snow we've got full driving literally out of our top gate but the beach isn't close the beach is a couple of hours away something we all really enjoy doing <clears throat> and we can't just pack up and go on a holiday we can go for a day trip yeah but we've still got to consider what time we're we leaving are we going to be able to feed all the animals make sure all the chores are done for the animals um, or be back in a reasonable hour that we can still do all the chores so if you are a family that loves going on holidays but wants to have it all you need to be able to consider whether you're willing to give that up No matter how big or small your property is, you're going to have fences, external and internal. We don't have neighbours on half of our property, which is awesome. Not that you can see or hear your neighbours here, but um, if you don't share an, a fence with someone, you have to bear 100% of the cost. If you share a fence with someone, usually you can negotiate 50-50. For us, we kind of take on the responsibility because it's our animals that are getting out and no one else's animals are getting in. We've got sheep, they're escape artists as I've found out. Cows don't really escape like that. But we've got really lousy fences and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to fix them, repair them or create them. Not only do we have 54 acres on the, to have a boundary fence on, but we've got I think seven or nine paddocks internally that we've got to um, maintain as well. I'd like to make more internal paddocks so they're smaller and I can rotationally graze my stock a bit better. But for now, you know, we've just got to deal with these lousy fences and fix them. You need to learn how to fix them, you need to have the materials to fix them, and fencing stuff isn't cheap. And you've got to do daily or weekly fence checks. Depends what stock you have, where you are, if you're on a main road you've really got to check your fences because if your animal gets out, you're liable for any damage, be it a car crash, um, that happens. If your animal causes a car crash, you're liable. I want to talk to you about water. Water is crucial, crucial to being self-sufficient. If you do not have a reliable water source, be it a spring, a dam, a river, a creek, rain you're not going to be able to do this you need to be conservative with your water use if you're not on town water if you're on town water you need to be aware of the cost <laughs> um, but if you want to grow your fruit or if you want to graze animals you know cows can drink 50 liters of water a day that's a lot of water so you need to be, you know, aware of your usage and conservative. Yeah, yep. You also need to fix dams that have leaks in them. We've got platypus here and they create holes in the dam walls, which means our dams don't hold as much water as they could or should. We've got three tanks. One of them's empty and we're in the middle of winter. So we need to make sure that we can fill that up so when summer comes and we don't get rain, that we've got enough water for us to be able to consume to See those little buggers? They're sheep. And we're having issues at the moment keeping them in. There's two points here. There's escaping stock and your ability to be able to round them up and bring them back. It's winter here. And the grass is getting short and scarce. So the sheep are wandering, looking for better food, more food. And even though next door's grass looks the same as my grass, <laughs> they think that there's more grass over there and they keep going there, eating someone else's food, causing me issues trying to bring them back. So you've got to make sure that you don't overstock. Yeah? 
You're not overstocking your land so that there's enough food for your animals, but making sure they don't get into someone else's um, pasture as well. See this? This is the crappy driveway we're left with. You can't get a sedan down this part of it. You can get a sedan down to the house, but you can't get a sedan down to this part. So you need to be prepared to fix your driveways. In winter, driveways get wrecked around here. We're on a hill, we get a lot of rain. It's clay, super slippery. It gets torn up super easily. So you need to be able to grade it. You need to be able to put crushed rock on it and maintain it because you need to be able to get in and out. You need to be able to have trucks get in and out, friends and family get in and out. And having something like this is less than ideal. Another thing to consider is weeds. These are thistles and they spread. Come spring, they'll start to flower. And when the flower, oh, don't touch this prickly. Once the flower um, has fully matured, then they blow off in the breeze. You need to consider if you want to do this organically or if you want to do it conventionally. Yeah. We're trying to do things organically here. So we've got things like thistles and blackberries. Bow spreaders both a nuisance and both really hard to get rid of. You can get something like goats, but you know, we're having issues with sheep. I don't want to get goats because they're notorious for escaping. Um, and they can also become a pest here in the Australian bush. And we live right next to the Australian bush, right next to a forest. And I don't really want it to become an issue. But if you want to do this organically, you know, that's a lot of work. We're going to try um, blow torching them, manually removing them um i think there are two ways we're going to try but you know if you even if you're doing it conventionally you still have to go out and spray it you need to have the expensive chemicals but you also need to have the gear like the sprayers and either a tractor or um you know on the back of a quad or something like that you need a tank and the spraying arm things so they're all a cost but they're all necessary If you live in an area like us with heaps of birds next to a forest, we've got things like cockies and parrots and bowerbirds, and they can decimate an entire crop. So if you want to be self-sufficient and grow all your own fruit and veg, you might need to be aware that you're going to contend with things like birds or rabbits, wombats, things that will dig up and eat all your hard work. This next part is a twofold. You need to be ready to prepare. You need to be ready to deal with death. With livestock, there's dead stock. We've had four animals die in the nearly six weeks we've been here. That's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. It's a lot for your kids to deal with not only dealing with that emotionally and physically, you need to be able to um, dispose of your animal. Um, but you need to be able to dig a hole big enough to bury them. We use the tractor. One of the times Paul did it by hand, but that's time consuming, it's laborious, it's exhausting. Another bonus tip is dust. I don't know if you can see that. I dusted that two days ago and it's already filthy. It's absolutely gross. You need to be prepared that if you're going to move to the country, especially if you're from suburbia, that you're going to get a crap load of dust. You just need to deal with it. How about mail? I don't get mail delivered to my door. In fact, if I were to go check the mail, I have to go about a kilometre to my mailbox. Do you shop online regularly? 
Is that going to be an issue for you? Is the speed going to be an issue for you? It's really slow out in the country. Things don't arrive the next day. Nope. And they often get left at the post office, so I'd have to drive 15 minutes to go collect it if I want to have it. How about your rubbish bins? Or a rubbish service? It's awesome that we can still have our rubbish collected by the garbage truck. But we need to put our garbage bin on the back of the car and drive it about three to five kilometers up the road. And that's where we put our bins every week. Sometimes we need to take two a week, depending if we've got recycling or not. Are you willing to put your bin in your car or on a tow ball hitch thing and drive it three to five kilometers to get it picked up? Is the internet important to you? We can't get regular internet here. We need to use a satellite dish. It's all right. It's maybe not as fast as I used to have back in the city. It drops out regularly. Are you prepared to live without internet?